I want to thank you all for coming, and I especially want to thank the ranking members behind me that are here today to discuss the letter that we are sending to uh, Speaker Pelosi requesting that HRES 109, the Green New Deal, actually has hearings in their committees. Um, this is the start of a conversation that I believe is long overdue, one that Congress and its committees should uh, have immediately. Congressional committees are where ideas like the Green New Deal should be debated. Only through the scrutiny of the legislative process can the American people get a true sense of how these proposals and sound bites translate into actual policy. We know so far that the Green New Deal proposes would control nearly every element of our lives, from our travel to home ownership to what agriculture we could actually even grow. And this is just the start. Its national mobilization includes government takeover of health care, free college, and an international exchange of technology that would stifle innovation and put America at a global disadvantage. Here's what the authors and co-sponsors of the Green New Deal aren't telling the American people. First, it is a bad deal for the working families and the low income. Many of the constituents that are in my district, each provision I just mentioned would disproportionately hurt the very people the author claims proposes to support. In my home state of California, for example, civil rights leaders are suing the state for climate policies that they argue drive up the cost of housing and cause a disproportionate amount of harm to the state's poorest residents. The Green New Deal is also threatens to throw away groundbreaking innovation that has already set the decline in American greenhouse gas emissions, like fracking and natural gas revolutions, solar and wind power and electric cars are just a few of the technologies that's caused American energy-related carbon emissions to hit a 25-year low in 2017, all while energy production and employment has soared. We have a responsibility to fully understand all the impacts of the Green New Deal and the impact that it will have, not on our nation, but will America be able to lead for the next century? You know, Woodrow Wilson, who many claims to be one of a great political scientist, he is quoted as saying, as Congress in its committee rooms is Congress at work. We believe that to be true. We need to get to work debating the Green New Deal. We do not want to repeat the mistakes that the Democrats made on H.R. 1, their very most important bill, referred to a number of committees, but only one committee marked it up. Even though the chair of that committee, Lowe, Zoe Lofgren promised that all the other committees would mark it up. Forty percent of that bill was never marked up when it came to the floor. This Green New Deal affects too much of every aspect of our life. Not just whether your job will be there, but the cost what it will be to every home, to the ability to travel, or even to the agriculture we grow. That's why we want to have an open process, much as Speaker Pelosi claimed to have on her opening day when she became Speaker. So now I'd like to turn over, turn the um, podium over to our ranking member on energy and commerce, Greg Walden. Thank you, Mr. Leader, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. We're here for an important reason, and that is to hold Democrats accountable, to allow Congress to do its job. We're here today to call upon Speaker Pelosi to hold hearings on the Green New Deal, a plan that has become a central plank in her party's platform. It's billed as a solution for climate change. The Green New Deal threatens the entire United States economy, and it stretches into every corner of American life. From one-size-fits-all government-run health care to federal job and wage guarantees to federally mandated building upgrades to 100% zero emission energy in just 10 years. And not only do we believe this is unrealistic, we fear it could permanently put the American dream out of the reach of millions of Americans. We're not alone. The FLCIO thinks the same thing. That's why these 11 Republican leaders from the committees who have jurisdiction over the Green New Deal have called on Speaker Pelosi and her committee chairs to do the right thing, and that is hold hearings on this sweeping plan. The truth is, House Democrats, the leaders, know exactly who has won the debate inside their party. That debate inside their party, I think, is pretty much over. The socialists left, led by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders, they've won. And now Speaker Pelosi and her lieutenants are hoping to paper over this growing gap. I say, let's let the American people have a say and a view on these policies. How Democrats should stand behind their proposals and give the American people the chance to learn what they're really about. Democrats and their allies dispute the various estimates that show the Green New Deal costs $93 trillion. Then I say one thing, prove it. Let's see your numbers. 
Let's hold hearings. Let's pull the curtain back and see where the Socialist Democrats stand and how American people might feel about a 22% increase in their energy costs. Frankly, House Democrats, I think, are afraid to have this debate in public and in the committees. As they know, the sensible re resolutions and proposals that Republicans are put forward are better. We're all about innovation, conservation, adaptation, and preparation. We've been about it in the Energy and Commerce Committee, certainly in the last Congress, and passed multiple bills that actually help lead to reductions in carbon emissions and more affordable energy, not only for us, but cleaner energy for the world. We want clean air, clean water, environmental protection, but those things do not have to be achieved at the expense of American workers, prosperity, and our own national security. Vibrant energy sector competition and innovation have already produced significant carbon emission declines in the United States, whereas emissions around the world, frankly, continue to rise, particularly in China and India. So, Speaker Pelosi, please direct your committee chairs to hold hearings on this legislation. Republicans are ready and willing to continue to have serious solutions-oriented discussions about how to protect our environment and how to advance America's prosperity. So we hope you'll hold hearings and do so soon. With that, I would welcome the chairman, uh, the former chairman of the Resources <laughs> Committee, the future chairman in exile of the Resources Committee, Mr. Bishop. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity of being here. Um, you know, for many people who live in the West, but also in rural and urban areas, the ideas behind the Green New Deal are tantamount to genocide. That may be an overstatement, but not by a whole lot. The genesis of this concept is really coming from Easterners who live in an urban setting and have no view of what it's like in the rest of America. When they judge distance not in miles but in subway stops, you realize there is something that needs to be discussed with this particular process. Now, in our resource committee, Mr. Graves from Louisiana over there introduced a proposal to our rules that would require any discussion that we would have in that committee to also, to also ex uh, Im analyze the impact of finances and economic impacts on that particular proposal. One of the, uh, it was a humble request, but one of the Democrat freshmen that's on our committee said the following. I want to quote him exactly here. He said, as these discussions happen, I think it, you bring out a really good point. Not only that some of the costs and how they affect industries and businesses, but even in the costs and how they affect people, and their utility bills, and what's going to happen. Then he went on further. I think we have to be very mindful of people, their jobs, their ability to pay their bills, because of the changes that we make. And this is a discussion that should always be had. We shouldn't just be speaking in the theoretical. So this is very, very important, and I hope that we continue to have this conversation because I think it's one worth having. Then they went on to defeat the proposal, ironically. But in, nonetheless, what he said is spot on and is accurate. So we're calling on the majority party, the, the current, hopefully short-lived majority party, to have serious discussions in all of the committees of jurisdiction in their areas of jurisdiction. I realized in my committee, the last climate change hearing, the discussion points were opioid addiction and concussions in the NFL, I'm sure you can find some nexus somewhere to that. That's not what we're talking about, not just hearings to check the box. If you're going to take this seriously, then we want to have serious discussions, and every ranking member down here has a, has a committee that has a jurisdictional nexus and should be part of that. So we definitely call, if you're going to go forward with this theoretical idea, let's come up and actually discuss what the details are. And with that, I'd like to introduce another one of my Western colleagues who has the area of what happens to rural, rural America, Mr. Conway. Thanks, Rob. Uh, it seems that our Democrat majority is, more, is most interested in doing the bidding of the extreme environmentalist <coughs> groups with blatant disregard for the impact it will have on our farmers, ranchers, and rural Americans. Either the proponents of the New Green Deal don't grasp the consequences of these policies that they will have on the agriculture in rural America, or the cynic would say they simply don't care. Just three months ago, the 2018 Farm Bill was signed into law, a five-year comprehensive reauthorization uh, act covering farm, uh, conservation, and nutrition policy in our country. It was completed after two years of work by the committee. The process included listening sessions across the United States, more than 100 hearings, and bipartisan discussion and collaboration between members on the committee. The Farm Bill protects farm and forest lands that assist producers in voluntarily, uh, uh, voluntary practices that sequester carbon, reduce pollution and greenhouse gas emissions, 
preserve farmland and improve the energy efficiency of farming practices while providing America with abundant and affordable food and fiber. In contrast, this new Green Deal aims to uproot the basic underpinnings of our farming and manufacturing energy and transportation systems and require changes of marginal and unknown benefit that come at great expense to the average taxpaying American citizen and business. This, this or any other similarly extreme proposal must have thorough public scrutiny before Congress takes any additional action. There's a lot that we don't know about the Green Deal, but however, there's a lot that we do know. We know that in rural America, uh, rural Americans travel further distances, have higher energy costs, and have lower medium incomes than urban Americans, making them least able to shoulder the new burdens of this new Green Deal. The same applies to rural jobs like manufacturing and small rural businesses that have a harder time adapting to any new green technology. We also know that U.S. agriculture uses a tiny percentage of energy consumed in the United States, but that the changes proposed in the New Green Deal would have significant implications for the ability of U.S. agricultural uh, system to continue to meet demands of fresh, safe, and affordable uh, food, both here in the United States and around the world. And while they're already walking back such silly plans as to regulate or eliminate noxious odors coming from cows, the proposal is completely out of touch and ignores the technological advances made by the agricultural section over the last 30 years, including doubling agricultural production, reducing energy use by 30 percent, while not increasing greenhouse gas emissions. And most of all, we know that U.S. farmers and ranchers are best stewards of our rural land and that they accomplish these gains voluntarily and through ingenuity. I'm very supportive of working to, the, to improve our environment. I'm also very supportive of working to improve rural infrastructure. And I'm supportive of doing everything we can for all of the U.S. farmers, U.S. farms, 98 percent of which are family-owned. But I cannot support attempts to foist additional regulations on the backs of our farmers and ranchers, certainly without additional uh, scrutiny and, uh, and hearings by the committees of jurisdiction. Madam Speaker, please instruct your committee chairs to have the hearings necessary to, fa to ferret out this uh, new Green Deal. And I now ask to Sam Graves, Ranking Member of the uh, Transportation Infrastructure Committee. <clears throat> Thanks, everyone. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity. From a transportation standpoint, if you look at the, the Green New Deal, it's, it's literally, it's fantasy land. It's fantasy land uh, proposal. This idea that we're going to eliminate uh, aviation in the United States is, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous if you think about it. Um, if you're saying that aviation is not necessary in the United States, and you're also saying that the 11 million jobs that aviation creates are also unnecessary, and then you think about the idea that we're going to replace aviation with high-speed rail, um, which has yet to work uh, in the United States. And all you have to do is look to California to see what the high-speed rail proposal out there, what happened with it. Um, it collapsed. Um, the proposal is done uh, simply because of the extraordinary cost uh, associated with, uh, with putting this together. Now, if you look at, if you want to talk about the alternatives, and, and this is one of the things that, that a lot of folks, particularly from from uh, the East Coast urban areas fail to understand when it comes to alternatives. If you're taking your kids to school or you're going to work, that's one thing, uh, to get an electric car or an alternative fuel car. But if you're moving uh, products and goods across this country, um, there is no alternative. There's no alternative for the jet engine. Um, there's no alternative for a diesel engine, uh, high horsepower, uh, in a barge tug. You can't plug the barge in tonight and run it up the river. Uh, tomorrow. There's no alternative. There's no alternative right now um, for pulling large trains uh, full of goods across this country. There's no alternative um, for cargo ships running goods uh, across our oceans. Um, there just simply isn't an alternative, and that's pure commerce. That is absolute commerce, and, uh, and we have to do everything we can to, uh, to make sure that it doesn't upset the balance in the United States and completely collapse our economy uh, as a result. Uh, now I'll turn to uh, Representative Lucas. Um, a little taller. <laughs> thank you, Sam. And thank you, Leader for McCarthy, for putting this together. In addition to my job of being the ranking member of the Science, Technology, uh, Space and Technology Committee, I represent the good folks of the 3rd District of Oklahoma in addressing climate change impact on them and ensuring that we keep energy prices competitive so we can protect our jobs and promote economic growth is a big part of my responsibility. We have a saying in Oklahoma, it's an old saying, and it goes something like, there's a fine line between doing things for people and doing things to people. Our responsibility as members of Congress is to do things for people, 
not to force higher energy prices, higher taxes on Americans with pie-in-the-sky, unrealistic proposals. That's not a Green New Deal. It's just a bad deal. And the ones paying the price for a bad deal will be the American consumers and American businessmen and women. Now, by some estimates, this proposal, and it's hard to gauge because the proposal keeps changing, might cost as much as $600,000 per household. That's an incredible amount of money. That's an incredible amount of money. Our responsibility on the Science Committee should be focused on how do we use research, technology transfer, innovative programs to address the issues that are important out there to our folks. Batteries that store energy from intermittent power sources, advanced nuclear reactors, carbon capture. But the bottom line remains, as my colleagues have stressed so <coughs> accurately, this new Green Deal, the vague document that we're trying to assess, we won't know until it goes through regular congressional order. That's hearings in all of the affected committees so we can get to the facts, so that we can determine the validity or lack of validity of the policy proposals. And ultimately, that determines what it does to our people back home. We're here for the folks back home. Remember, we're here to do things for people. There may be people in this place who are here to do things to people, but that's not us. And with that, I turn to my colleague, the ranking member of the Financial Services Committee from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry. Thank you. Thank you, Gigantor, for yielding. Price you pay for being pretty. That's right. So I'm glad Sam Graves and I kind of sandwiched in. Uh, anyway, so I'll skip uh, forward. Um, look, uh, I think uh, what is happening in our climate is an important discussion for us to have as policymakers, as Americans. It's an important conversation we should have globally. There are important things that we should be doing to improve uh, the efficiency of everything we use and to re uh, reduce harmful uh, greenhouse emissions. Those are the things that we should be working on in a bipartisan way and using innovation and technology. But what we have before us is called the Green New Deal. It is no deal at all for the American taxpayer and for the average American. Uh, it hurts the very people that it's intended to help and it hurts people in every single state in this nation. So let's focus on the House Financial Services Committee and the jurisdiction I'm working in. Uh, the Green New Deal requires every single house unit, housing unit in America, meet a new energy and water efficiency standard with zero emissions. So let's unpack what that costs. So we have uh, uh, roughly 130 million households in America, um, and the Green New Deal would cost uh, each one of these households between $13,000 uh, and $34,000 to upfit or retrofit these, this housing stock. This is uh, the housing stock in America is a, a, the median uh, age is 36 years for this housing stock. So that's a lot of money when you're talking about the whole of our housing stock. But if you just look at HUD owned and directly subsidized housing, that's 5 million units. So let's apply that for what that would mean in direct government outlays to retrofit those 5 million HUD subsidized units. It would cost between $66 billion and $172 billion. That is larger than the whole of HUD's budget since its inception. So these numbers are staggering, and the impact it has on the American people is real, and it's negative. We should be having a substantive conversation of the things that we should be doing in a bipartisan way to achieve outcomes. On this matter, though, on housing, we put it to a vote last week in the House Financial Services Committee. Sean Duffy uh, from Wisconsin offered the amendment uh, that is the direct verbatim piece of housing applied to House Financial Services Committee, and it was unanimously voted down. In fact, the, right, the chair of the committee called it an unserious offering of an amendment. It's a very serious consequence, though, uh, if we allow this harmful policy to be put in place. It will have a harmful effect on uh, affordable housing and a harmful effect, especially on those that are on the margins. So with that, uh, I yield to uh, Garrett Graves of Louisiana. Thank you. Um, I, I want to thank the, the authors of the Green New Deal for, for brainstorming and throwing out um, concepts to help improve our environment, to help bring down energy costs, to help to raise wages and provide better job opportunities. For, for all Americans, because you know what, those are objectives that I share. Um, but I think it's important to dig in 
to the proposal that was actually put on the table. Uh, when you actually look at it and you dig into it, it resembles more of a political memo that was accidentally converted into legislation or some type of utopian grammar school exercise that was accidentally turned into legislation. When you look at the objectives, look at what has actually been accomplished by Republicans and by a Republican majority. You want to talk about raising wages, look at what we did in regard to helping to level the playing field for American workers, for American businesses across the globe, and look at how we reduced unemployment to record levels. Look at how we wage, raised wages to record levels. Look at how we provided nearly unprecedented job opportunities, employment opportunities for all Americans. Those are the strategies. Revising our tax code, helping to modernize our regulations. Those are the strategies that provide opportunities for Americans. As has been noted, this, this package is estimated to cost perhaps $93 billion. Excuse me, trillion dollars. $93 trillion. We add to that the $30-plus trillion Medicare for All, the $22 trillion debt this nation has today. $450,000 per man, woman, and child in this nation. We need to unpack this. We need to have hearings. We need to have discussions. I've heard Democrats over and over again accuse Republicans of denying science, as Chairman Bishop noted. There's another type of science that's being denied here. It's called economic science. Economic science is being denied. My home state of Louisiana, we have the lowest energy rates in the nation. Look at the states that are advocating or proposing th this Green New Deal concept. Those are the states that have the highest electricity bills in the country. Is that the model that we want to replicate? Moving in a direction of Obamacare, where we were told that government intervention in health care was going to reduce costs, and we've seen the complete opposite. Is that the model that we want to replicate? The Green New Deal has a credibility gap. There are clear strategies that have been accomplished by Republicans that clearly achieve the objectives that are identified in the Green New Deal, but it is a very different path to that success than we've seen in this deal as proposed. Thank you. Take one quick question because I, I only got 40 to go. So I read that um, you were on an airplane back and uh, reading some article about AOC. Just wondering, you know, she's clearly the champion of the Green New Deal. Is this part of the strategy to target her? Um, she's asserted that Republicans are obsessed with her. Are Republicans obsessed? No, I, um, it's interesting. I was on my phone going through as I was flying into D.C., up from New York, um, it was when Omar, uh, the, the leadership, talked about doing a resolution against the anti-Semitic comments that Omar had made. And I think it was Politico that said something that, um, referring to whether the article would come up. So I was reading all the different articles. A former um, Obama administration uh, employee felt to look over my uh, phone and thought it was interesting that I was reading articles about politics and what was coming up on the floor. But he rephrased it to it was an AOC article. Uh, it wasn't AOC. It, I think it had AOC in it, but it was just reading up. Last question, I got to go. Yep. Could you identify the most significant piece of climate legislation that House Republicans are working on right now? You know, there's a number of them introduced. Um, gladly to walk you through a whole proposal of them. If you talk to um, Garrett Graves as the ranking member of um, sure. well, climate. Well, He's got a great one, proposal. One I will come back. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks. I love it. <laughs> I wish you'd answered it. <laughs> you know, but are you obsessed? <laughs> That was a great question. Oh, yeah. That was an yeah. awesome question. Q&A there. Now, they probably thought so.